Hi, welcome to Dean Park and the Summer Update. Hope you're keeping well and enjoying some of the summer sunshine. There's lots been going on at Dean Park this month, including a number of exquisitely detailed kits from West Hill Wagon Works. I'll take a look at Dean Park's latest fleet acquisition in the Class 60 from Hornby. I'll also be sharing my initial views on the Cavalex announcement that they're going to do a brand new Class 56. Currently the only one you can get is this detailed Hornby model. I'll also be able to share some progress made on my scratch build factory, with significant progress being made since my last update in late May. And finally, I'll be taking a quick look at a new release that didn't quite make the grade for Dean Park. I hope you enjoy this video, and if you do, please don't forget to click that like and subscribe icon, and also the icon at the bottom right hand side of the screen, which will take you into the Dean Park channel, so you can view all previous uploads. In the last month or so, I've been doing some little kits. I tend to like doing kits in the summer because I can do them downstairs where it's a bit cooler and more comfortable and then obviously bring them up uh, to the layout when they're finished. I've got a lot of West Hill Wagon Works kits that I've bought over the last few months so I thought I'd better get stuck into building some of them. Um, and I've got a selection in this video. What I'll do is I'll split it into two parts and I'll kind of um, you know, spread out the number of kits that I'm going to show you because I've been doing quite a lot of them. All these kits that I'm going to show you from West Hill are available at their online shop. The link to that is in the description below. Okay, let's look at the kits here. I've got a set of uh, metal work benches. They've just been primed and painted in um, a tank grey from Humbro before weathering the, the frames and the surfaces using some rusts, some browns and some black weathering powders. Some of the details actually on the tables. Um, we've got a bench drill that I've picked out in green and you probably see some of the silver detail that I've picked out as well. I used a silver paint pen for that because you can get more accuracy than with a brush. I've put the five pens there just to give you an idea of scale of some of these tiny kits. Also on top of the tables we've got some tool trays. You get 12 in a pack there from West Hill. Um, traditional toolboxes that I've picked out in red and a kind of metallic blue, both from the Tamiya um, acrylic range and then I've got some open trays there which I've picked out in blue or dark blue with some uh, silver handles at each end and then I've got the more traditional um, toolbox that I've just painted out in grey um, with a black handle and then silver ends. To the right hand side there we've got some portable welder trolleys um, I've picked out the actual the welder uh, machinery if you like in the red with a Tamiya blue and then tip the tank with some orange before painting the frame black. You might be able to also see some of the detail on the very end of the welder trolley there that I've picked out in um, black and silver. At the back of that we've got some welder bottle uh, tanks on a trolley. Again, Tamiya blue, black frame with um, orange tips on the tank. I've also painted up some workshop or depot trolleys. You get four in a pack. I've painted them in a kind of metallic blue. The actual surface of the trolley um, is painted out in a, a rubber black from Tamiya. And then I've used some weathering powders, rusts, earthy tones, oil staining to give that kind of in-use worked appearance. You may also be able to pick out the small silver centers of the wheels on the trolley there as well. To the right hand side, I've got a pack of Class 47 wheel sets. You get them with a kind of wooden uh, cradle for them to sit in, so you might want to put them in a wagon load or something or on the back of a, a truck. Um, I've primed them and then painted them in um, rail match enamel sleeper grime before picking out some of the, the gearing um, and the axle boxes in a kind of oily um, black and just basically give them a general weathering. The detail on these is stunning, even down to the, the tiny printed detail on the axle box itself and the individual teeth on the, the gears inside the wheel there, as you'll probably be able to see there. You get these for um, Mark 1 and Mark 2 stock, um, Mark 3 I believe are coming and the Mark 4 uh, wheel sets are already out as well. And I also think they're looking at releasing some more um, locomotive sets as well. These are really uh, impressive. I mean the amount of detail that you can get on these 3D printed items is just phenomenal. And it's only ever going to get better, isn't it, as technology improves.
as I indicated in my introduction, the um, Nairn building here has had some significant progress since my last video. The link to that video is at the top of the screen. I've managed to fit the windows, the concrete uprights and horizontals, as well as some weathering on the brick as well. It's not quite finished, but I'll take you through the, uh, the work so far. From this angle, you can see the depth of relief that I've got on this factory. And um, this is actually the wider relief. There is less of a relief at the other end. Um, it's the same kind of construction as my previous Nairn building with panels of brickwork with um, the concrete flooring slightly protruding from the brickwork. At the corner here we've got the concrete pillars. Um, these are actually made from two pieces of MDF that I've then joined and filled so you don't get a, an edge there. And then obviously when I've primed and painted it, it's all appearing as one particular um, section of concrete. You see down here I've got a lintel and an open doorway just now. That'll obviously be getting a door frame and a door fitted. Um, and I've used the same kind of lintel that I've used in other parts of my scratch build as well, which is a piece of square MDF um, put into a cutout groove above the door. Looking at this view, you can see I've put a solid back on the model. Um, it's just slotted and dropped into the sides and the ends here. The reason I've done that is to stop any light bleeding from any interior detail that I put into the building. Um, obviously I've had light bleed from the back, it might go into the back scene and creep out any gaps between the edge of the building and the backboards themselves. My scratch builds take quite a long time to do um, due to the construction that I make them. Um, you know, they're all quite robust and probably over engineered, but um, you know, I, I try to build it so that it's uh, as, as sturdy as it can be. One of the main challenges for this build um, in keeping with the prototype was this circular window which actually appears on each side of the tower in the real building. However, I've only put it on the front due to the quite narrow relief at the sides. I managed to achieve this um, with great care and thought and I've even managed to put a, a circular stone surround there around the window with individual um, mortar lines and the window itself has got a white window surround and glazing fitted behind that so you can hopefully get a sense of the depth of that and I really am chuffed the way that's turned out to be honest. If you look at the prototype um, photographs you'll notice that a lot of the windows have been bricked up um, and that is a kind of 1990s onwards version of the building. When Forbo took over Nairns they made some alterations to the buildings and I'm assuming around about that time they, they bricked up some of the windows. The building is also Harold in real life I am um, struggling to find a, a good scale um, replica of a Harold finish so I decided to go with the brick for this particular building but this is it in its 1980s and before version with all the windows in position. The windows are from York model making um, and the glazing is 0.5 PVC plastic and it's been um, lightly dusted and weathered before um, fitting it to the, the weathered frames just to give a, a weathered in use appearance. You're not going to get windows in a building that aren't dirty um, in some degree, especially if it's a factory, um, because you know the windows were never really cleaned. This view will afford you a look at some of the subtle weathering that I've applied to not only the brickwork, but the concrete horizontals and verticals. It's under the light just now, which kind of eliminates a lot of the subtle tones, but when it's in position on the layout, some of the weathering really does pop. In order to complete the build, I've still got to put the roof in position as well as this side wall here for the tower and then edging and railings and I'm working on them just now so um, all being well, this model should be completed within the next two or three weeks. Right, some more kits, again from West Hill. We've got some fire hose reels there. I've painted up three out of the four that you get in the pack. Um, they're 3D printed, they come as one piece, so you've got to prime them and then paint up each individual part the color that you want. I've just used um, some Tami acrylics. We've got flat red, flat aluminium, 
flat black and then an earthy brown for the base to represent the wooden structure that it sits on. Really quite fidgety and fiddly but really impressive and rewarding when you paint them all up. Down at the front we've got these tiny um, wheel chocks, you got a four pack there and these are used in marshalling yards and depots to hold say wagons in position um, when they're in the siding. Um, these have just been painted up in a tank grey and I've even rusted the chocks to represent the rust that would maybe come off the, the wheels that they've been resting against. The kit at the back is an inspection access walkway and you get two in a pack. I've painted this up in an as new condition so it's just aluminium with a rail match enamel um, warning yellow handrail and you may be able to see as well down the side of the ramps a very fine yellow line as well. The detail you can get on these is amazing uh, including a very fine tread pattern on the walkways. Okay, um, down at the front we've got um, a couple of cats. This is from the four pack of cats that you get. Um, they're all in different poses. I've just painted one up black with white paws and a white tipped tail and a caramel cat with dark brown paws and brown ears. To the left hand side we've got some air compressors. The detail on them is stunning, even down to the little chain that you get between the two gear wheels. At the back middle we've got um, some filing cabinets. I just painted them up in a Humbro 64 grey and then picked out the handles with uh, silver. We've also got some gradient posts there. You get a whole pack of different um, configurations for these gradient posts. The lettering and numbers actually um, sticks out from the post, so it's easy to pick out with a, a black Sharpie. Just run it across the, the letters and numbers and it picks them out really quite easily. I've just kind of dulled them down with some um, earthy browns and some rusting powders as well. At the back right we've got some detailed um, storage trays. I've painted them up in red and you might be able to see some of the detail inside. I've picked out in silver and that's just to represent um, screws, nuts, bolts and that kind of stuff that the workmen or the, the engineers on the depot might need. So I really are impressed with these kits. The detail is stunning and it just shows the power of uh, 3D printers. In mid-June, Cavalex models surprised many of us with their announcement that they are going to produce an all-new Class 56 grid. As I highlighted in my introduction, the only current model on the market of this heavy freight locomotive is the detailed and well-received Hornby offering. Now before I go on, I'm not going to rip into the Hornby model, it's a good product which I enjoy running on my layout. It has an impressive level of detail and is one of Hornby's best diesel locomotives. However, there are areas where the tooling variations are limited and don't allow Hornby to accurately cover all 135 of the prototypes. Cavalites are looking to fill that gap while at the same time avoiding duplication of particular prototypes that have already been released by Hornby. You'll see in the series of render images from Cavalex that a significant brass etch detail incorporated into the model to allow all variations to be accurately addressed. According to Cavalex, the model is significantly advanced and at the tooling stage to accurately cover all 135 locomotives produced between 1976 and 1984. Those of you who are familiar with the 56 will know that the initial batch of 30 locomotives were built in Romania. These locomotives have distinctive features not present on the later BREL designed locomotives. These features include a distinctive Romanian shape, full buffer beam cowling, square mesh side grills, cantrail grills and roof grill, rubber seal cab and cab side windows, circular buffers on the initial batch, recessed headlights, and a distinctive panel in the centre of the nose for the horn grills. There were significant issues with the remaining batch with reliability and build quality among the problems faced by BR. Therefore, the second batch was constructed in the UK at Doncaster, where tweaks were made to the design albeit still using the overall Romanian template. It wasn't until the third batch of locos 056-090 built at Doncaster Works and the final batch numbering 091-135 built at Crewe and Doncaster 
The alterations and upgrades were made to the design to address the issues found on the Romanian design locomotives. Cavalex are addressing these alterations with exterior changes that include distinctive fabricated cab shape, cutaway buffer beam, diamond mesh side grills, cantrail grills and roof grill, steel cab and cab side window frames, additional air conditioning vent on the second man's side and the revised protruding headlight design and horn grills. The specification for these proposed models is impressive. This includes a wealth of separately fitted parts, an alloy chassis to allow the locomotive to pull prototypical wagon rakes, a five pole motor with twin flywheels geared for prototypical running with slow speed control, a 21 pin DCC interface, provision for an EM2 speaker in the chassis as standard, easy conversion to EM or P4 wheel sets, and a feature I'm really excited about, and I'll be interested to see how they achieve it, a separately fitted motor to power the roof fans. The initial release of 13 locos will cover a wide range of liveries, including large logo, subsector liveries, EWS, Colas, rail freight grey with and without red body band, load haul, and my personal favourite, BR blue with yellow ends. Information on where these locos can be pre-ordered is on the Cavalex website. As you'll have seen from the video introduction, I've got myself another Hornby Class 60. This time it's R2747 and uh, it's a subsector local in petroleum livery. And the running number is 60062 and the name is Samuel Johnson. This particular model was from the initial releases of the Class 60 from Hornby. So you're going back well over 10 years now since this model was on the shelves. I first saw this model actually on the uh, Everard Junction's layout and since then I've always wanted the petroleum livery to class 60. I've obviously um, purchased uh, another 60 uh, previous to this and that was in construction livery and they haul my current favourite wagon which is the Acura scale PCA. Um, but I've nothing to haul my tankers with um, and the forthcoming Cavalex TEAs really need a class 60 in petroleum livery to haul them round the layout. So when I saw this uh, model I snapped it up and uh, I'm really glad to add it to my layout. This Hornby model is one of their best ready to run diesel electric locos. Um, when it came out, it was streets ahead of the others uh, regarding detail. Um, you know, the fine mesh, um, etched grills, uh, even interior behind the grills. It really is a stunning model and it has dated very, very well um, through the, the years. And it's only now that other models are catching up with the level of detail that Hornby applied to these models in the early 2000s. If you've got a Class 60, or even this Class 60 from Hornby, get in touch in the comment section below and let me know what you think of it. Um, obviously having a, a new release one compared to one of the original ones, you can see some differences in the, the build of them. But one thing I'd like to see in um, Hornby's future releases of these models, and indeed a lot of their ready-to-run models, is a move away from the 8-pin interface into a more modern version um, of DCC, for example. Um, 21 pin would be the minimum standard that you really expect these days. This would allow more lighting functions um, and generally, you know, more usability on DCC. A few weeks ago now, Hornby released their latest version of the Mark III DBT in attractive intercity swallow livery. The code for this was R4996, a code which is probably etched on my memory for all the wrong reasons. The model in front of you is not R4996, this is the previous release from a few years ago now, um, and I'm just basically going to talk through some of the, the shortcomings on the, the current model. This version is highly sought after, um, and this particular release was um, going for well over £100 on eBay and other auction sites. So you know it was in demand and it was about time that Hornby addressed this by releasing another version. Which, to the, to the relief and excitement of lots of us, um, they did announce for the 2020 range. Eventually arrived in early summer and initially all was well until the examples started um, hitting the, the layouts 
and people started to address some of the issues that they were having with them. I no longer have the latest release of this model. Um, I did purchase it from my local hobby shop and all seemed well until I brought it home and started having a closer look at it and then the glaring errors and flaws of the model became apparent. For me, it was a case of £74 um, do I put up with a model that you know has issues um, or do I try to repair it myself or do I just take it back? Um, and I came to the conclusion that you know for £74 I shouldn't be having a model that wasn't up to scratch. So I took it back um, and the, the chap at the, the shop, Stephen, was very understanding um, and I've placed an order for another product using the funds from um, what would have been the, the DVT purchase. As I talk around the model, I'll put images on the screen of um, the latest release showing some of the errors and the flaws. Some are my photos and some are others who've uh, posted on Facebook. First off, we'll start with the cab roof. Um, there is a, a mould seam line around about there and obviously identical on the other side. In previous releases such as this, it's very clean, you can hardly see it, especially obviously in the white colour. If something's going to show up, it's going to show up when the model is white. On the new release, it appeared like a crack uh, had appeared along the seam line. It wasn't, it was just a very, very rough, raised and damaged edge to the tooling. Um, you could get around this by taking a very fine sanding stick, taking the, the, the rough um, edge out, priming and then painting. But for some of you, that might just be a bridge too far considering the model costs over £70. And getting the same colour of white to match the rest of the model might also be an issue for some of you. Not to mention trying to mask off this cantrail stripe without making it um, look uneven when you apply the new white paint. Another thing that I noticed on the new release, which doesn't appear on this um, previous release, is the application of the white banding along the side above the red. It has been tampoed on separately from the white cab and there's a slight indication of colour difference at the very end of that um, white stripe. Not really noticeable um, for, you know, from your two feet running distance, but if you get up close you can see it on the model. Another error that they made on the latest release was the colour of the window surrounds. They should be black on the latest release, they were painted silver. Something I didn't initially notice until I put both side by side and it really is um, a big difference when you actually look at it. If you look at all the prototype ones that were in service for Intercity, um, they were all black window surrounds. Other little niggling flaws on this model, which in itself aren't really, um, you know, detracting from the enjoyment of the model, but for purists out there, they might be um, arced enough to make some alterations themselves. First off, the horn vent grill is the wrong shape for this particular swallow liveried one. This represents a later um, refurbished version that obviously Hornby have tooled for and then tried to backdate it for the swallow version. There's also an issue here with the wrong valance or no valance fitted to the intercity swallow livery. This should have a white valance along the side underneath the buffer beam detail. Um, again, Hornby haven't tooled that for the original version. Another issue is the shape of the buffers. The original ones had a more um, square style buffer. Again, this one has the oval ones, which is for a later version um, in service. So again, Hornby have failed to backdate it correctly for the intercity swallow liveried one. When Hornby designed their highly detailed models in the early 2000s, um, they were fitting superb details to them. You know, the cab interior was second to none. The extra fitted parts were, were superb. And they were also fitting opening and sprung cab doors, which are a gimmick a lot of you detest, a lot of you like. Um, the Mark III DBT has uh, sprung doors and in this model here they're perfectly closed and I could push them open and it'll close perfectly. The latest release from Hornby, um, you can open the cab doors but they don't shut properly because they don't fit correctly. Um, again, just, just little niggly things that annoy you. Um, the quality control on these models, the, the build quality is not as good as it was on this first release. I've talked about all these niggles and small flaws but I've left the the biggest one till last, and that was the ridiculous light bleed that was coming through the cab um, surrounds the cab roof from the interior lighting and the head and tail lighting, which was bleeding right across the, the lighting bar at the front. Um, the image on the screen now will show you how bad it was. Now I contacted Hornby um, and 
you know, politely re requested um, some feedback as to how this had happened. Um, it's clear from looking at the model that they've made it from white plastic. Um, it's either thinner than before or not the right grade of plastic, but it is very thin and allows the light to bleed through. Hornby, um, to their credit, said if you send it down, we will um, take it apart and repaint the inside um, to stop some of the light bleed and also repair the, the issue with the cab roof. However, I wasn't really keen on doing that, especially not with a new model at over £70, so I decided not to bother. Because I've got this one in front of me that is good enough to run on the layout. Um, if I suppose if it was my only one that I had um, with the new release, I might be more keen to keep a hold of it and get some repairs done on it, which I'd probably do myself, to be honest. Um, I could mask it up and dismantle it myself and do a, a decent job. So there you go, that's me kind of summing up the latest release um, from Hornby regarding this um, Mark 3 DVT in Swole livery. I understand that the network rail yellow ones were also afflicted with terrible light bleed uh, and, and similar build quality issues. Now, those of you who watch the channel know that I'm a massive fan of Hornby. I've got a lot of Hornby product on my layout and I think they're a fantastic um, part of the hobby, producing some of the best ready-to-run models out there, if, if truth be told. I have never ever taken a model back to a shop with a flaw and not been able to get a, a good replacement of the same model. And when I contacted um, Stephen at the hobby shop, I said, look, can I have a replacement? He goes, Dave, all three of them that I've got left are the same. So really for me, this is a massive disappointment. I've waited so long for another Mark III DVT in Swole livery and to have to take it back because of these glaring issues, build quality errors, it really is unacceptable for me. I really am disappointed. If you've come across this model, um, if you own the model um, or even taking it back after purchasing it, please get in touch, post your comments below as to what you think of this. This is no by any stretch of the imagination uh, a Dave rant. I've just pointed out some of the errors um, and obviously if you wish to buy the model and you're happy with it, bash on, great news. But unfortunately for me, it just went a little bit uh, too short on the old quality standards for me to keep here at Dean Park. If you've enjoyed the video, please click on that like and subscribe icon, as well as the icon at the bottom right hand side of the screen, which will take you into the Dean Park channel, so you can see all my previous video uploads.